Detail. Hold. Post. The first stripe in our flag is red, and it stands for valor and loyalty. We have often proven that we possess these qualities in great abundance. The first stripe goes at the top of our flag. It represents Delaware, the diamond state, which was the first colony to ratify the Constitution. The second stripe is white, symbolizing purity and innocence. Americans have always felt that these were important qualities. This second stripe belongs to Pennsylvania, the Keystone State. As the third stripe goes in place, we remind you that the name Old Glory was first given our flag by an old ship's captain in 1831. His name was Charles Doggett. This stripe represents New Jersey, the Garden State, which was the third colony to approve the Constitution in 1787. The following year, 1788, eight colonies ratified the Constitution, starting with Georgia, which is known as the Empire State of the South. It was the fourth colony to approve the Constitution. Let me mention that Old Glory was first carried at the Battle of Brandywine on September 11, 1777. As the fifth strike, representing Connecticut, the Constitution State, goes in place, you may be interested to know that on January 28, 1788, our flag first flew over a foreign territory at Nassau in the Bahamas. And it was the French Admiral Lamont Pequette who gave our flag its first foreign salute on February 14, 1788. Now we come to the sixth strike, which represents Massachusetts, the Bay State. It was here that the Boston Tea Party took place, where Paul Revere made his famous midnight ride, and where the Battle of Bunker Hill was fought. Next, we put on the seventh stripe in place. The seventh stripe represents Maryland, the old line state. The blue canton in the upper left-hand corner of our flag was always a basic part of our flag, and the first seven stripes butt up against the blue canton. South Carolina is next as her eighth stripe is added to our flag. Let me remind you that our flag stands for national independence and sovereignty. It is the flag of our more than 250 million plus, I think we're probably up about 3 million now, well, 300 million, free people, firmly united. South Carolina is known as the Palmetto State. The ninth colony to ratify the Constitution was New Hampshire in the Northeast. And that's just how our nation and our flag grew. From the farthest limits of America, our flag gave hope to all the people that freedom would never perish. New Hampshire is known as the Granite State. Tenth Strike represents a cautious colony that delayed approval of the Constitution until they were certain that the Bill of Rights would be a part of that guarantee of liberty. And only then did Virginia, the oldest of the colonies, often referred to as the mother state, ratify the Constitution. Virginia has been nicknamed the Old Dominion State. In July 1788, New York, the Empire State, became the 11th state. She truly symbolizes hope, for it was here at a later time that most of our early immigrants, citizens, first saw the shores of their new country as they entered New York Harbor and saw the Statue of Liberty, symbolizing hope for a new life. November, by an overwhelming vote, North Carolina, the Tar Heel State, 
approve the Constitution and join her neighbors in the new union. She is represented on our flag by the 12th strike. Finally, in 1790, by a plurality of just one vote, small but proud Rhode Island, known as Little Rhodey, took her place in the Union, and we placed the red 13th stripe at the bottom of our flag for her. Though not generally known, the first American flag contained 13 stripes and had in the upper left-hand corner the British Union flag. The Canton with its crosses of St. George, that's the Red Cross, and St. Andrew, that's the White Cross, showed our relationship to the mother country of Great Britain. This flag, which is called the Grand Union flag, or sometimes the Continental Colors, was ordered by General George Washington in January 1776 to be hoisted at Charleston, Massachusetts in honor of the creation of the Continental Army. Though it was intended to be and was seen as the flag of the United States, not just the flag of the Army. This flag was used on many occasions before the year 1777. On June 14th of that year, the day we still celebrate as Flag Day, the Continental Congress meeting at Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, authorized our first official flag by entering into the Congressional record one sentence with no introduction and no explanation, resolved that the flag of the United States be 13 stripes alternating red and white, that the Union be 13 stars white in a blue field representing a new constellation. This resolution by the Congress left unanswered questions of size, shape, arrangement of the stars, or the number of points that each star should have because communication in those days was so very slow. These decisions didn't always come to the attention of the people who were making flags and, as a result, there were many variations of the design. Although modern historians agree that Francis Hopkinson, a congressman from New Jersey, who also signed the Declaration of Independence for that colony, designed our American flag. Tradition still credits Betsy Ross with sewing our first stars and stripes in her Philadelphia home. And the design of the five pointed stars could have been hers. The flag you now see has come to be known as the Betsy Ross flag. The circle of stars was arranged at the beginning of our great nation. It took the colonies over two years to ratify the Constitution but we must remember that the horseback communication of those days was much slower than today's. Actually, 29 months were required to acquaint 13 colonies with the terms of the Constitution and obtain their approval. The stars were put in the order as each colony ratified the uh, Constitution. 1787, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. 1788, Georgia, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maryland, South Carolina, New Hampshire, Virginia, and New York. 1789, North Carolina. 1790, Rhode Island. Two additional stars and stripes were added to the flag in 1795 to recognize additional states that had joined the Union. Vermont was the 14th in 1791 and Kentucky in 1792. The flag you see is the Star Spangled Banner. It figured in many stirring events. It inspired Francis Scott Key to write what has become our national anthem. It was the first flag to be flown over a fortress over the old world when Lieutenant O'Bannon of the Marine Corps and Midshipman Mann of the Navy raised it above our stronghold in Tripoli April 27, 1805. It was our ensign at the Battle of Lake Leary and was flown by General Jackson in New Orleans. Fearing that too many stripes would soon spoil the true design of the flag, Congress passed a law and President James Monroe signed the bill on April 4, 1818, retiring the flag, in other words, taking off the two bottom stripes, 
returning the flag to the original design of 13 stripes by stating that the flag of the United States shall be 13 horizontal stripes alternating red and white. A white star to be added to the blue field upon the admission of each new state. The new star to be added on the 4th of July following the admission of that new state. Between our first 13 stars, 13 stripe, and the 50 star flag of today, there have been 26 official changes in the arrangement of the stars. I am the flag of the United States of America. Though I was never an orphan, I was adopted by the Continental Congress in 1777 and became the national emblem of a nation newly born on this continent, fighting desperately for survival and destined to bring to all mankind a new concept of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In one form or another, I have been many places and witnessed many events in our American history. I saw the signal that started the midnight ride of Paul Revere. And I was there when they fired the shot heard round the world. I saw Molly Pitcher take up the cannon swab from the hand of her dead husband and help to carry on the fight for freedom. And I rode with Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys. I was there when General George Washington became Commander in Chief and I felt the biting cold of, of Valley Forge and gave comfort to the tired and hungry Continental Army. I was flown above the decks of old Ironsides and from the mast of the Yankee and China Clippers. I was there in the last twilight at Fort McHenry and inspired Francis Scott Key to write the Star Spangled Banner. Now our national anthem, and I blaze the trail west with Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, and Lewis and Clark. I was carried through the halls of Montezuma and to the shores of Tripoli. I fell to the ground at Custer's last stand and there were no friendly hands left to pick me up. I galloped up the slopes of Jet San Juan Hill with Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders. I stayed with the boys in World War I until it was over over there. And I was with them on the battlefields of the Marne, Chateau Thierry, and St. Michel, and the Argonne Forest. I have kept my lonely watch over the graves and have stayed to watch the poppies grow between the crosses, row on row, in Flanders Field. I was raised by six brave men during the hell of Hiroshima, and I sank beneath the waves with the four heroic chaplains who went down with their ship to honored glory. I proudly waved over our troops fighting communism, oppression in Korea, Vietnam, and the hot deserts of the Middle East. I have been carried to the North Pole, the South Pole, and yes, even to the moon. These events have come not without cost. Throughout our short history as a nation, when danger is threatened, Millions of Americans have left their homes and families to defend me, and the nation for which it stands, some never to return. Yet they are wrapped forever within my folds, for their purity is remembered in my stripes of white. Their blood has given me stripes of red. Their souls are carried in my stars, and their courage is embedded in my blue. I am an inseparable link in the chain that binds men to God and country. I am called the red, white, and blue, the star-spangled banner, the stars and stripe, but I am most often known by a nickname given me by an old sea captain who called me Old Glory. But remember this solemn truth. This nation cannot survive on the sacrifice and valor of our ancestors. It is our duty, as it is the duty of every generation, to sacrifice when called upon, to endure when necessary, and to willingly assist, preserve, protect, and defend these United States of America at all times. Only then can the greatest nation ever known to man continue to serve as a beacon light 
for generations of the future.